Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to TAFAF Afternoons, um, a new feature of the cultural program of programming of TAFAF New York. We're so delighted to have you here. Um, we also have coffee. I have to put in a little plug for coffee talks in the morning on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, and one more TAFAF afternoon on Monday afternoon. Uh, but you're here for this fantastic program, I can guarantee it, of conversation with Paola Prestini. And uh, Karen Wong has graciously accepted the very easy duty, I'm sure, of, uh, of drawing uh, Paola out on all the wonderful work that she's doing. Karen is the deputy director of the new museum, and I will just leave it at that. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, I'm, I was probably chosen because I've gone through the arc of first being a fan of Paula's, then a colleague, and now a friend. So this is a, a delight for me to, to be here with you in conversation. Um, Paula is a Juilliard trained um, composer in modern composition and the co-founder and artistic director of National Sawdust. But I, I wanted to like tackle the first thing, which is you as an artist, um, and you, we, we had talked earlier that it's um, modern composition, but of course, um, growing up, you know, I took classical piano, and then friends told me, oh, it's now going to be new classical, and then I tried a bit of jazz, and then, you know, it was modern, um, and now it's contemporary. So kind of walk us through um, these genres of, of, of music that you're involved in. It's a great question. So, I mean, the idea of genre right now, I feel, in uh, contemporary composition uh, is really just slipping away. And in fact, like if you really think about genre in general, they, it was really not created by the musician. It was created by the person trying to sell the music. So we have to categorize this in order for somebody to understand if they're going to like it or not. The composer or the musician uh, actually creating that music isn't really thinking about that. They're drawing from a canon of things that have uh, inspired them and then filtering it through their personality and their set of principles uh, to create the abstract form of modern composition. So, you know, when people ask me what my music sounds like, it's, you know, trying to kind of think of ways that I can describe it that will help them understand or hopefully entice them to listen and then make up their own opinion. So it's, it's quite interesting because there's a seamlessness to how you're um, positioning music, and given that we are at an art fair, it, it makes me think that in some cases, you know, in the art world, we, we're still very interested in painting, sculpture, video, and of course, I think a number of artists are now trying to combine everything and um, and make things more theatrical, which is which is certainly happening in your field as well. You know, this idea of immersive um, experience. And, um, and it's hard not to also kind of relate it to some current events. So I'm thinking of um, Jeff Koons' balloon dog in Paris for Jay-Z, or you're thinking about the floating stage for Kanye. And you know, on the, on the one hand, you know, spectacular, um, gorgeous set design, but very much in the proposition of eye candy. And you know, the way you've worked um, with the idea of theater is, is just so much integral to a creative process, so much more innovative and authentic. And I'd, I'd love to you know, have you take us through maybe the, um, the piece that I think you said you actually prototyped here in this building. Okay. So just, one, just backing up into this question, um, when I was at Juilliard, uh, I wasn't very popular while I was there because I wasn't, uh, I wasn't just happy to be studying composition. I was so intrigued by the other disciplines there and I was desperate to collaborate with them. And while on one hand I was you know, very happy to be getting these chops and being, you know, refining uh, the skills that it takes to survive as a composer, I was also desperately aware of what it would take or at least afraid of what it would take to, to build a, a career. Um, as a woman composer. And so while I was there, I actually began a company. And uh, it's very interesting because a lot of composers now or musicians or artists ask me, when should I take risks? And I'm thinking, oh my God, you should take risks all the time. But, you know, especially now, you know, that you're young and that you're in school. And for me, I really think that, you know, I treated Juilliard as if it was this kind of, ex you know, extremely, uh, I guess, fruitful umbrella under which I could experiment and try all things and that I could fail and um, that it would be a safe place. 
I don't know necessarily that it was a safe place, but in my mind, I was going to do it. Um, so fast forward, I, I really spent the, the 10 years after school um, workshopping interdisciplinary work in every single basement church in the city. Um, in fact, <laughs> I was very excited um, to learn that I had been given this theater on Monday nights at 11, and that all I had to do was give them the ticket sales, not understanding that that was you know, a dark night and that nobody would come, and that it really wasn't a big gift. Um, but yes, I was in residence here at the Armory for a year. It was one of the best years of my life, and it was much later, because it took I, you know, I think a lot of people have the myth that um, if you go to Juilliard, you're just going to make it. I, I was not a shooting star. It took me 20 years to build the career I have, and I'm actually very happy that it took me that long, because now I know how to sustain a career. But once I got to the Army, it felt very much like I'd been given this extraordinary pedestal upon which that I could, you know, create the kind of real vision that I would had in my brain for a long time. And I developed a work called Aging Magician, not in this room, but in the Board of Officers. Um, should I show a photo? Okay. So this is, um, we workshopped it, and uh, part of the thing about when you commission your own work, which I do, uh, still commission a lot of my own work, um, is that you have to keep showing presenters the work in progress in order for them to pick it up and then finally develop the work. And so this was a, uh, a workshop with Rindy Eckert, who is a brilliant multidisciplinary artist. He is a singer, he was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for writing, um, he's also a composer, uh, and Julian Crouch, who is one of the most extraordinary puppeteers and theater directors. Uh, he actually founded Improbable Theater Company in London, um, and then went on to direct, uh, co-direct Satyagraha at the Metropolitan Opera. He's a beautiful designer. So this piece is completely um, not, in, it's completely original. It was based, I wanted to redo the tale of Charon crossing the River Styx, but instead of crossing the River Styx, um, our clockmaker would actually cross um, the East River. And his, uh, his afterlife was an imagined afterlife and it was Coney Island. Um, but he takes all these, uh, this, he takes the train and the train stops at all these stops, and each time you stop at a stop, you get a little bit more about his life. And the children are um, the Charons, they're the, the narrators. So he never makes it to Coney Island, he dies before, but this is what it looks like when he gets there. And that's an instrument that we prototyped up at Mass Mocha. It's made from junk and from clock pieces and wheels, and the idea was that um, all these parts of his imagination would congeal to form uh, a Coney Island of his dreams. And so that last piece is completely put together um, with improvisation and, uh, and you know, music and singing and staging. And this was eventually brought to the Walker Art Center in uh, Minneapolis, um, to Arizona State University, to Mass Mocha, to the Cran Art Center, and finally on Broadway at the New Victory Theater. There, there's a lot of people on stage. Talk a little bit about that because I know you often work with the um, uh, Brooklyn Youth Chorus, and, and and why do you why do you like to work with with young people because they can mess up. You know this choir. That's a great that's a great point. First of all, this choir rehearses every week, and they are so professional. For them, it's you know training through modern composition. Which if you know you think about it, that's amazing that young people are actually being trained through the music of their time. So to be honest, that's a huge inspiration. And then what was really great in a way about this piece is it took five years to pick up. So the kids were 12 when I started with them and they were 17 by the time they got to Broadway and they were not the kids that I had imagined in my head but there was no way I was gonna say to them, you're too old, you know, you're not my kids anymore. Like, you're, you're my kids, you know, you just have to wear costumes that make you look younger. Um, but it was, am <laughs> it was amazing and uh, we learned a lot together. And I mean, doing something like this, just, you know, again, um, to try to demystify this, this creative process, which, you know, takes as long to make buildings. I mean, oftentimes architecture is also uh, one of these uh, long drawn out. I mean, f five years, um, many dozens of collaborators. W what, is, what is that like? And what is your role as the composer of the music versus maybe somebody who you brought in to come and produce, someone who's come in to direct, someone who's doing the lighting, the set design. What is your role in all of that? 
So I am both a composer and a producer, so I do raise a lot of the funds for the pieces that I do. The irony is I always thought, I cannot wait till I get commissioned by a big company, because then I don't have to do all the hard and heavy lifting. And this year, I was finally commissioned by this big company, and I didn't choose any of my collaborators. Luckily, I loved them, but it was a really interesting lesson that, in fact, all this work that I had been doing for 20 years wasn't really preparing me for something that I didn't have already. It was, in fact, the answer that I had been looking to all along, and that it's amazing when someone actually pays you to do the work, and I'm blessed and I hope I get more, but that, in fact, I always have the work that I want to do and the collaborators I want to work with and the risks I want to take sometimes don't fit into a box that is easily commissionable. So. Did I answer the question? No, not at all. You, you started to, so that's as a producer. Oh, so but, what do I but, do? But, you know, but given Sorry. that it's your music, but I, I'm just so interested, so you know, how do the other characters, does everyone have to essentially like, go by what you say? You know, no, no, if no. You're the, <laughs> no, no. Um, I mean, so basically I put together the team, and that's a really exciting part for me, because it's like, assembling a cast of characters. When you work with someone for five years, they become your family. They become your family after the experience, but you're building for five years a work together. You're frustrated by each other, you have great moments of you know, happiness. Um, so that's my role, is really at that principle, bringing the people together. And then, you know, like in this piece, we really worked, the three of us, Julian, Rindy, and myself, as principal co-creators to pass by the script. So for example, um, this is a funny process because typically as a composer you're given a libretto and then you take that those words and you have a couple of months to write the music. But like the character in the book, in the, in the opera, Rindy had writer's block and so he wasn't giving me text. And so we came two weeks before we had all these presenters coming and he was like, he came in and he plopped down this book and he said, I got it. And I opened it, I was like, great, Rindy. And I opened it, and there were all these drawings. And I was like, Rindy, these aren't words. What am I going to do with this? And, uh, and he said, you know what? Just write dummy words, and then I'll come in, and I'll write it into the music. And it was really great, because that's actually what ended up working. But uh, you know, these are kinds of very different collaborations that force you to be flexible and to think through the lens of other people. And for me, the reason I got interested in theatrical and interdisciplinary work was because the same way I learned through other composers, I wanted to understand the process of other interdisciplinary artists and how I might learn for the rest of my life. One of the um, exciting things, obviously, in your position and, and now having a career of, of 20 years is whom you can collaborate with. And, um, and when you think of the great um, set designers in the last 50 years, you probably first have to start off with um, uh, Joseph Zabado, who is Czech and um, in the 50s and 60s um, probably did some of the most imaginative and um, s stunning uh, set designs, mainly doing a, a lot with, um, with lighting and shadow um, and image making. And, and then, you know, you jump to the present and you have the English designer, Ez Devlin, um, who started in, uh, in Shakespeare, um, but subsequently has, quote unquote, graduated to the multi-million dollar set designs of Beyonce and Adele. Sandwiched in between those two, um, one must say the legacy of, of um, Bob Wilson. Uh, you know, he's, he's legendary, uh, controversial. Um, I'm sure we've all seen, you know, at least one or two of his works. And um, I had the uh, immense pleasure of getting to uh, go to Watermill, where you are uh, right now in development of, um, of an opera with, with Bob. So maybe take us through what that experience has been like. Sure. Um, this is a piece that I've been trying to get off of its feet for five years uh, as well. And it's called Old Man in the Sea. It's a piece that I have been wanting to do forever, and I wanted to do it with Bob. And so I had been introduced to him about 10 years ago and uh, through a, a common friend who was also a donor who had uh, commissioned, uh, I, one, was one of the commissioners of Einstein on the Beach. And um, before this friend in common uh, passed away, he said, I hope that one day you work with Bob. So this is a work that I had in my head, um, you know, dedicated to Mickey, and I went to Bob and I said, would you, would you please just 
do this with me? And he looked at the treatment and the ideas and he said, yes, come up to Watermill, we'll spend a couple of weeks and we'll, we'll see what happens. And so um, what was really great is, is just the process of working with Bob is, is extraordinary. It's a, you know, it's a mentorship in itself, but also there's a tremendous respect. And so we built a timeline, we built the set, I started to build the music. We're very close to finally having presenters. Um, and commissioners, and uh, it's, you know, I think the, the, the piece offers me as a composer um, a very fertile ground of cross, uh, cross-cultural uh, study. So it's about, you know, looking at the music of Cuba and looking at the influences of the Yoruba culture there and understanding, um, you know, baseball statistics and Marlene Dietrich and all the things that might have been happening in Hemingway's life at the same time that he was writing Old Man in the Sea. So it's really about these parallel threads, Hemingway's life while he was writing it and Old Man in the Sea. And then it's like kind of explodes the form of opera. So it's written for a cellist, Jeffrey Ziegler, who's amazing. And um, and then a set of uh, five uh, um, vocalists who are some classically trained and some improvisers. Then dancers, choir, and uh, yeah. So should I play a little bit? Okay, so these videos are made, um, they're workshops that just to be able to kind of, if you will, sell people onto the idea of what it might look like in the end, but it's very raw. So here you go. Stand by. Go. to the ship set keel to breakers forth on the godly sea and we set up mast and sail on that swart ship war sheep of all war us out onward with bellying canvas Circes this craft of the trim kaifed goddess then sat we amid ships, wind jamming the tiller. Thus with stretched sail we went over sea. To start first with um, that that image that flash, which looked like a um, a ring, a boardwalk in a circular you know um, format uh, in 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 a sea or or at the beach, is 
Was that the original idea of how this could play out as a performance? So originally, it was supposed to be for the Commonwealth Games in Australia. And it had a whole commission, and it was supposed to be on a raft at sea, and that circle would connect the raft at sea to the beach. And then the audience was on the beach. And it was super exciting, because Bob hadn't been actually doing site-specific work for a long time, and then that fell through. So then, but what was great about it, I mean, you know, these things happen, is that we kept that concept of the raft at sea. And also, there is a touch of poor man's theater, which is, you know, not a typical Wilson aesthetic. And I think there's something very interesting to the way the piece originated in terms of that commission and where it's going to end up. I think it's going to have a seed of that initial potential right. piece. And then, um, for those of you who have been you know, at Watermill. Um, I think they, every summer, they have an open open house. I would encourage everyone um, to to try to see that. But what, what was that experience to be in that space and also um, work with Bob, who obviously has a very specific way of um, storytelling, storyboarding, um, the kind of range of references that are, are coming across. How is that interaction with you as the composer? You know, he's uh, extremely collaborative. I think that, um, I, I mean, it was one of the most open experiences I've ever had. We, the first summer, we did not actually basically do any music. We actually sat around a table, and the goal for that summer was to have a timeline, and a timeline that would include all the references and all the, you know, the storyline. And so the actual libretto wasn't written until the next summer. And so it was wonderful. It was a, it was a lot about um, really finding you know, the story within this that would be unique to Bob and unique to me. And, and uh, it was an extraordinary process, very communal. And then um, Helga Davis. Wow, I mean, um, stunning. I've, I've, I've met her on a couple of occasions and, and, and seen her perform uh, many times now. Um, you have a long relationship with her. Maybe tell us how, how that came about. So for those of you that don't know Helga Davis, you should look her up. Helga was, um, I met her before this, but she, be, she became the lead character, one of the two lead characters in the remounting of Einstein on the Beach. I had the fortune of meeting her years before that and being very, so inspired for her, by her that I wrote her an opera. And it was called Oceanic Versus. And um, in it was my first real foray into improvisation and what to do when you really bring improvisation into opera. She has a four octave range. Um, she can sing anything. She's an actor. She's, um, you know, has the most extraordinary voice, but also soul. And uh, we've been on a journey together now for a decade. And one of my favorite instruments is the cello. And so, you know, I, I, we need to shout out Jeffrey Ziegler, who's in the room, uh, who also happens to be your husband. So I, I'm going to take this opportunity to ask, like, Disclosure. <laughs> um, you know, um, how is it to... Um, uh, tell your husband what to do in that context. <laughs> There's no telling my husband what to do. Uh, neither of us tell each other what to do. It's more a wonderful collaboration. And, you know, like, to be honest with you, any collaboration that becomes very uh, close, it, there's friction. So there's, there's just, in a way, we have to, you know, make sure, I mean, we have to go home together, so we have to figure it out um, much sooner. But it's, it's the best for me as an artist to live with an artist because there's a lot of sacrifice as an artist. So I don't think, I'm, perhaps somebody else might understand it, but it's a really nice thing to not have to explain what you do every day. Well, bravo, bravo on that. Um, and so, and then maybe just um, you s five years in the making, some ups and downs. And, um, and so can you kind of tell us when we might finally be able to see this? 2020 to 2021 season. So in that season, it'll premiere either in, yes, I can't even say where, but yes, it's going to premiere. That's super, super. Um, I want to segue a little bit into National Sawdust, but before we do that, um, you know, you have spoken um, with me as a, as a friend that um, you had wished when you were coming up, um, uh, an incubator space like National Sawdust, but you, there weren't really those kind of um, systems in place. And that, um, you know, being a female composer, there were um, many boundaries that you had to push through. And, and maybe just speak a little bit about 
um, what you did face um, trying to work through the, the New York City ecosystem of classical music? Sure. Well, I mean, modern composition doesn't have a huge history of women in it. I mean, if you look at uh, the Met Opera, they had their first woman composer last year. Their first woman composer. Boo. Boo. <laughs> there, you know, I mean, this isn't just the Met Opera. I mean, I could name so many organizations. So it's really not, it's just, it's something that's uh, endemic to the field and I know other fields as well. Um, my own challenge was the same as... Uh, Many of my contemporary colleagues who are women, just there, there, were, there was not very much mentorship. Um, and the idea of helping each other out wasn't really part of the dialogue while we were in school. So um, I was very fortunate to win uh, one award, which is the only award I've won to date. It's called the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship. And it changed my life because it wasn't for music. It, was, it actually put me through school and it allowed me to start my first nonprofit. <clears throat> and when I first uh, got into the room, there were all these fellows who were thinking about uh, sustainable economy and how they might change the world. And all of a sudden, my little problems became very little. And I realized that this approach um, to building my career needed to change, that in fact I needed to be worried about the context of my career and others, and that if I commissioned others and I commissioned myself, I could have the kind of career I wanted. And Paul said to me, Paul Soro said to not just me, to, the, to our class of fellows, he said, if you have one piece of pie, don't divide it, make more. And that was a huge thing for me because it was like, of course, you know, we're all fighting for the same little scraps. They're not necessarily even the scraps I want. I mean, of course, we all want recognition, but you know, it's not really what I want. What I want is a completely different career. And then began the very slow build. And uh, you know, the failures which force you to keep going and force you to keep reimagining. Um, the backstory of um, National Sawdust is so interesting. Um, maybe kind of walk us through um, Kevin Dolan's journey and, and how you met him. So I met Kevin through Limor Tomer, who's an extraordinary curator at the Met Museum. And Limor had discovered me. She had um, played, uh, I was one of the residents at the Whitney Museum when she was uh, there. And Kevin had come to her, and I guess he had been through 20 other people to start the space. And when he finally asked Limor, she said, there's only one person, which is really nice of her. And she said, you have to meet Paola. And so Kevin, I was living at the time, half time in San Francisco, because my husband was in the Kronos Quartet, and Kevin flew out to San Francisco to meet me. And I remember we sat down, and it was, I mean, it was just the most um, humble and honest reason for why to start something, and it felt so right. I mean, he just said, you know, he, so he's, a, he's an attorney. He's a, it's actually very funny. I'll tell you this funny thing. He's a tax attorney. And when I first got introduced to him, I was like, oh, man, he's, you know, this, I'm probably in trouble. <laughs> I haven't done my taxes in years. Oh, God. But that wasn't the reason. And um, it was the most humble reason to start something. He had found himself through composing at the age of 60 and had always been a musician. But really, once he found composition, he discovered himself. And so he has two children who uh, also loved music. And his basic premise was, I just want to start something that will help the younger folks out and make it a little easier. And at that time, I didn't think I would be fundraising. I thought he had raised all the money and I was going to come in and do the vision stuff. And I learned very quickly that that was not the case. Like anything in life, that was very naive of me. But he basically gave me carte blanche to create what I would have imagined to be the perfect space for young composers. And that I could have that kind of power in my 30s felt like the biggest gift I'd ever been given. Now, I had always imagined that I would have started a school, but when I was famous and like 60. So this was a little sooner. And balancing that and a career and family and my own desires and putting that in context was all of a sudden not kind of what I had imagined when I was 20. I thought it would be easier, but it's been a, a great gift. And then I went on to help him raise the remaining $8 million for the building. And I guess what I love um, hearing about Kevin's story is, you know, his day job is tax attorney, but, the, but how passionate um, music is as, as part of, of his life. And then he also came upon an architect, um, a, a young, brilliant architect who helped manifest National Sawdust, um, which we'll show image in just a second. And his backstory is that he um, is also an opera singer. 
Peter Zuspin of Bureau V. Yes, uh, an incredible partner in crime to me in those early years because he, he really got what the space was meant to be in. The, the space, here, let's look at it. So that's the outside of the space. It's um, a sawdust factory, so uh, actually a funny story. So it was originally called, wait for this, it's terrible, Original Music Workshop. Try saying that like three times fast. And then it autocorrects on your phone to OMW on my way. So every time I would try to say, I'm coming, I'm going to on my way. And eventually, a friend of mine named Elena Park said, you're so silly, just call it National Sawdust. It's a great name. And it was called National Sawdust on the building. And we changed the name, and it's much better. We commissioned an incredible... Um, an incredible uh, uh, artist, um, Avaf, to do the outside. And there's Helga Davis right there. It's an homage to her. And it, what Peter did, which was so special, was that it, what Bureau V did was that they really wanted to create a space that composers and musicians of all styles and all kinds would want to write for. So the room itself has extraordinary acoustics. That's what the room looks like. And it's all suspended so that um, you can't hear anything going outside and that it actually fits the, the value of a, the world's highest recording studio. It is completely um, transformable. We've done the most extraordinary uh, theatrical pieces, operas, hip hop, um, I mean, all over the place. The ticket prices are low. It's got 12 residencies a year. It's, it's, it's a real dream space. And acoustically, it was designed by Arab, who Kevin likes to say were the only grown-ups on the cause. And um, f you know, and having an architecture background, I think just what is so exquisite about this piece in the New York City landscape is, um, you know, we have a number of spaces where we can do very large-scale um, spectacle work with blue chip names, and it's so utterly refreshing to have a more intimate space where you are working with uh, young emerging artists and, and giving them their first platform, their first break, um, so that you know, perhaps if they want to, they can graduate into these, into these larger spaces. Um, one of the ways uh, we came in contact is, um, uh, is the new museum has an incubator at the intersection of art design and technology. And, um, and to your credit, um, for some reason you saw some synergy and, and you had reached out and said, ooh, you know, I think we're gonna collaborate at some point. And I was like, hmm, I don't know, okay. And um, you had this um, amazing uh, film director who had come into your space uh, when you were composing the Hubble Cantata. So maybe kind of, Let's tell that story. Sure. So first of all, I, I had admired, um, when, when we were doing case studies and of what already existed in New York and what niche we could fill, and also who we wanted to emulate, which is in, super important to do when you're building something because you don't want to repeat things, the, the new museum, specifically the, the incubator part, New Inc., had come up as a dream partner, but also something that we wanted to emulate in terms of you know just more music specific. So. I was composing this piece called the Hubble Cantata with the lead astrophysicist of the Hubble Telescope to commemorate the telescope's 25th anniversary. And um, I wanted to do something very different visually, and I decided that I wanted to do VR. And so I came across this young filmmaker who's since then exploded. Um, and she and I decided to create um, basically a VR experience that would take you through the Orion Nebula and give you the first experience at the time you know, people weren't experiencing VR with the facility that you are now, because of course technology just, you know, evolves so, so quickly. But what we did in the end was we created a live spectacle in Prospect Park for 6,000 people where they experienced the cantata with um, free VR in a surround um, sound uh, setting, uh, open air, and it was extraordinary. And Eliza uh, developed it at the new museum. So we do partner with people a lot, and that was a wonderful example of where she might not have you know, received uh, as much just being in residence at Sawdust, whereas, you know, being at the new museum, all the contacts for VR were so important. The film went on to Cannes, to South by Southwest, and, and the piece went on to LA Opera, so it had a good life. And I think, you know, what's quite extraordinary, extraordinary about that is, you know, VR is still in its kind of nascent phase, 
Um, but you were really also one of the first to figure out how to use this technology in a communal space. And then beyond that, um, you know, it's, it's just so troublesome um, to put on the headset and then you have to usually put on um, some earphones and by that time you have five pounds on your head and um, and so again you know your ability to understand VR as an experience with a live orchestra and creating that sound and then all you had to do was kind of handle the Google cardboards I thought was was amazing and and then you know uh, finding Eliza McNitt, who is the film director, and uh, her time at New Inc. Um, took her to her next phase, where she did the first VR film um, about the co uh, cosmos, and she premiered it at Sundance, and she is the first person to ever get a seven-figure deal on a VR film. Working with Darren Aronofsky. Right. It's amazing. And, so, um, and, a, and a woman to boot, so, um, so that's very exciting. Um, you have an amazing uh, residency program. Yes, it's a little long, yeah. so you'll tell me, or I'll, I'll okay. show a little bit yeah, and then I'll talk about it, but you'll let me know when to. Oh, this is Helga Davis. This is an extraordinary piece that she developed with us called Requiem for a Tuesday. And it was done in the round, and it was this extraordinary um, response to Black Lives Matter with Reggie Redrock Gray, who actually did the gorgeous piece in the main space here called Flexen with Peter Sellers. And they were in residence um, before the, when we you know, first opened. National Sawdust is this very special place. It's like a silence and chaos. And when I come here, the noise is gone, and, and I start to be able to see the essence of my own thought. The, the work here is really intimate, and you, you get a chance to really feel the artist in the work. And it takes me away from what can be so trivial and, and so distracting, and it makes me realize that that's why we're living. And I think that Doing that with a community and with intimacy the way sawdust can do is really valuable. Sawdust gives space, time, and resources for projects that may not otherwise find a home. Venues have been turning away hip-hop. And so for me to have a space to come to and say, hey, I want to wrap my head off <laughs> um, and really say something um, means a lot. My residency in December, I can't think of another place in town that would have supported that in the way that that project was supported. It was a total blissful <laughs> joy being here. One thing that was really cool about that residency for me, and so this was a moment that allowed for a real cool overlap and fusion of people from LA and New York to come together and have a weekend of really rich programming. What was shocking to me is that they asked me to do something, whatever I wanted to do. And so when we did Orphic Moments, it had a kind of energy and in the room there was a feeling of... So kind of share with us um, how does someone get to be um, part of this residency? Uh, what's the application process like? And what are you looking for? So the residency, we have 12 different residencies and they're awarded to everything from composers to opera directors to groups and residents. Then we have curators. Um, and then we have summer labs. And I say all these three because it's the way we program. So summer labs is where very emerging artists can come and receive support and time in the space. And it's really at the beginning of their careers. And Latasha, the rapper, um, actually came through some of their labs and we loved her so much that we gave her a full-on residency. The residency is where they re actually receive funding, uh, 17 hours of recording time, um, full mentorship, and all of our partner um, kind of experience. And that's actually done uh, through our curation. We actually, what we learned is that not everybody 
um, will benefit from what sawdust has to offer in the sense that if someone's too advanced, then what we give is peanuts and it won't mean anything to them. Whereas for somebody much younger who are, or who's at the right moment or needs a very specific type of mentorship, it will mean much more. Then we have curators and they actually use their big names. So from everyone from Philip Glass to Laurie Anderson to Nico Muley, they use their big names to, um, discover, to help discover artists that they're very passionate about. Um, and then we get over, like we, I mean, we get so many applications for the residency as well. So we have open calls and um, there's 250 programs, so a lot of people get into National Sawdust. It's incredible the amount of talent that exists here. And then, you know, the residency is quite frankly just a small part of, of National Sawdust. I think what you saw there is also um, the diversity, the intergenerational, yeah, um, Philip Glass, Renee Fleming, who have all been incredibly generous to perform there and, and, and oftentimes as, as benefits. Um, but, you know, you guys are on, um, I think, three or four times a week, so times that by 52 weeks. It's, it's a very, very dense program, and so how, how are you juggling all of that? So the team at National Sawdust is extraordinary. They're, I mean, it's many of them are artists. Um, many of them have been artists. Um, they're, I mean, it takes a very special type of person who wants to be part of a startup. Let's be frank, because startups nearly kill you. Um, and the team is, you know, the most hardworking team we've ever had. And they're very passionate about the cause. And so, I think what we're doing, it's. You know, I always, I never like when people say, oh, what we're doing is so new or it's going to like change the world. Um, I don't think that. I just think that what we're doing is necessary. And so this idea of really taking an idea from the beginning phases all the way to the dissemination, meaning a record label, which is what we have. We have a criticism wing. This kind of nurturing, there will always be a need for it. And that's the whole point of sawdust. I don't think it's going to go out of style because there's always going to be someone who needs that kind of arc. So this is probably a good time to open it up. I'm sure there's folks here who would love to interrogate you some more. Do we have a mic to pass around? Great. And if you don't have any questions, I'm going to start talking about Beyonce and Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> Which I'd love to talk about, so <laughs> shall okay. we? Let's talk about the Pulitzer Prize in music. Great. Kendrick Lamar, what, what's your opinion, Paul? So, first of all, I think it's the best thing that ever happened. I think the Pulitzer has been going to the same group of very rarefied people for, you know, for a long, long time. And if you look at the, the kind of arc of this change that has happened, I mean, it started with the 80s, where Ellen Tafes Phillips was the first woman to ever win the Pulitzer. Then you get into the 90s, and Wynton Marsalis won. Um, then you get to Henry Threadgill, and you know all these ideas of what consists of modern composition becomes really just what is great music. And so to me, Kendrick winning is, you know, first of all, extremely important because he's an amazing artist. Then, uh, you know, extremely important because it allows us to really look at, um, you know, how people are listening to music, how people are producing music. And then finally, extremely important because the only, you know, to have a, a person of color win is very important. Modern composition is mostly white. Um, and in the sense of who's winning, and that's not okay. So, you know, this breaking down the boundaries and really creating equity in our field, um, it it's just everybody has to be part of it. And so when I heard most of the people in my community just, you know, sending this outcry, you sent me a great podcast about it, and it's I, the, the outcry that I understand is that many people were upset that someone who's so, um, you know, Established, established would win. Yeah. Okay, so you know that's fair enough. Like I could see that how that might be upsetting, but every other outcry really just it had a bad smell. And um, and you know when you were talking about um, your magician and the number of folks on stage, it was hard not for me because if I recall, you had a hundred musicians. Um, and, and that's the exact number that apparently Beyonce had at Coachella. Um, and I was lucky enough um, to be there um, a couple of weeks ago. I was at her second performance. And, um, and it kind of really uh, goes back to where we started about this idea of where um, 
music performance is going. Um, and, and one has, you know, one could look at it in, in a way where ultimately it's about business because musicians are no longer making music um, or money via their labels um, and everything is about being on tour. So the notion of how much effort is being put into performance has, has really elevated, I think, everybody's game. And um, I would love to hear, did you catch any of the... Um, uh, of Beyonce's um, on online, or have you seen any of the videos, and what's your take? So, I mean, a couple things. I think, I mean, my take is that she's extraordinary, and that the performances are amazing, and they're huge spectacles, and they've, um, you know, they, it's, it's a very important, if you will, uh, platform in terms of, not platform, it's a very important expression to have that kind of large theatrical um, expression. She's amazing. She's, uh, I think, you know, if you look at, for example, what John Zorn is doing in composition, you know, obviously he has some things where he's completely in control of the material and some things where he's working with improvisers. I kind of think the same thing about Beyonce, what she's doing in terms of choosing the most extraordinary improvisers and collaborators and producing the producers makes what she's doing so extraordinary. And so I like to just think about how this exists in all these different styles. And um, to me, all that composition means is assembling sounds and organizing sounds. And so that's all it means. You know, and, and I guess, I mean, your question is what I think about Beyonce. I, I, I have lemonade on my phone and I'm crazy about her. Um, I didn't go to Coachella and I, I've been a little busy lately, so I didn't see as much as I should have. Um, it's, I think it's also, though, important to remember um, uh, our forebears, and, 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 um, and, I, and certainly I, I, I agree that Beyonce is, is amazing, but it, it, it does make me think about Harry Belafonte, who um, actually six years ago called out um, Jay-Z and Beyonce for perhaps um, not being... Um, socially active enough given their hundreds of millions of people that they can influence. And uh, it is extraordinary now to see that Jay-Z is talking about mass incarceration or that's kind of um, uh, the area where he's become an expert and Beyonce creating an, an experience which really presents black history to, to such a wide audience. Um, and so I wanna kind of flip it back to you as an artist, as an com and composer, um, you're hopefully just, um, you know, not even midway through your career. Um, what kind of legacy would you like to leave behind? Well, before I take it to myself, I just want to say that one thing that really excites me about where, um, you know, music in terms of modern composition stands is that a lot of a lot more artists are actually thinking about the intersection of social justice and music. So, like, if you take, for example, Carnegie Hall, you think of it as like the most elite kind of, you know, certain type of music. And Sarah Johnson, who's the head of education there, has basically brought social justice front and center to the hall. So I think a lot of artists, a lot of presenters are really understanding um, that in order to, uh, you know, th there's been great moments in history where art has preceded social change, extraordinary moments. And in order for um, the arts to really be relevant as a fabric of society, um, artists need to keep thinking that way and need to take that responsibility. In terms of my own legacy, I think that, um, I think that, I think very much in the moment, in the sense that I'm doing exactly what I want to be doing. I, I just want National Sadas to survive the beginning phase of how hard it is to build. And I want it to serve as many artists and to really bring equity to the field in terms of um, you know, really being a much more inclusive look at what the music community should be. And for myself, I hope that I can find the balance to keep writing and to you know, be able to wear these multiple hats that I wear uh, with dignity and that I can do it well. <laughs> Well, you've done brilliantly so far. So thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you to TEFF so, for this opportunity to share. A huge thanks from TEFF New York to have these wonderful, wonderful artists and, and commentators, cultural commentators, I have to say, is a big part of this conversation, which is which matters a great deal to us, and also for me personally to have this discussion about this blurring of lines of theater, visual arts, 
music, composition, all these areas is, is, a, is a conversation I hope we can continue to have because I think it's really important on the artistic side and for the audience who may not be as aware of how substantial that change is to begin to think about perhaps their own perceptions and their own aesthetic approach to theater, music, visual arts in a different way. So I think you've opened up um, a lot for us to think about, opened up our minds to thinking about it in a different way, and um, I'm really grateful. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. Have a great evening. <laughs>